Hello everyone. We are going to spend the next hour making yet another long journey to the past, mainly to medieval times. For tonight, my talk will be about the history of castles, fortifications and defensive structures can be found all around the world and we will take an overview of this but we are mainly going to focus on European castles because there's a lot to tell about them and also because during the Middle Ages they became much more than military buildings they were centers of power they embodied the organization of society in many places. They turned into places of courtly life, of artistic creation. A large part of warfare in the Middle Ages and the early modern period was about besieging and defending castles. We'll talk about this too and we'll see how they evolved into modern fortifications, losing their high and thick walls and beginning to go underground following the introduction of new weapons. But as usual, we will go through all of this progressively and on a slow pace. This story is made for your relaxation, or to help you fall asleep. So there are timestamps pinned under the video to help you navigate it, and maybe return to where you left. You won't need any visual support to follow along, so don't hesitate to keep your eyes shut. You can just listen, sitting or curling up in the comfort of your bed and everything will fall into place. You can now also follow me on Twitter. Yes, I'm a late adopter of social media. Maybe I'll be on TikTok in 10 years. And you can also listen to my stories on Spotify, Apple Music and other music streaming sites. There are links for all of this in the description. If you wish to download this video or the audio together with dozens more, it is already available for download on my Patreon page. Your support on Patreon is much appreciated. Now take one single deep breath and as you exhale, try to let go of the tension in your shoulders and your limbs. We are now ready to begin our journey to the past. If you live in or if you travel to Europe, east or west, north or south, you may have noticed that castles are really abandoned. There are thousands of them. Some are in ruins and others still inhabited. Some look medieval, while others were transformed over the past few centuries and have turned into testimonies of different architectural styles. Some are small and look just like a big fortified house, while others are enormous with dozens and dozens of rooms. But why did castles proliferate this much during the Middle Ages? To understand it, we need to go far back in time. It is likely that in humankind's history, 
The need for defensive structures appeared with the accumulation of wealth and resources such as food that could attract other people's envy. Everywhere around the world where urban civilizations appeared, with a more productive agriculture and a more complex society. Fortifications also appeared, initially in China, in the Indus Valley in India, in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, later in Mesoamerica, South America, Africa, Europe. There were probably smaller defensive structures, like ditches or palisades, that appeared earlier. But archaeology indicates that a big rise in fortifications happened during the Bronze Age, that started in the 4th millennium BC, around the world. And it ended at various periods in the 2nd or 1st millennium BC, depending on the regions and their progress in metallurgy. The Bronze Age finishes when the Iron Age begins. Western and Northern Europe were relatively slow in developing defensive structures, and they consisted, generally, of earthworks that is to say, artificial changes in land level with ditches and elevations made from piles of rocks and soil. Together with wooden palisades, these uh, early European Bronze Age fortifications helped defend the position, typically on top of a hill. These hill forts were located to exploit a rise in elevation for defense, and they typically consisted of one or several lines of earthworks. Some of these forts could protect a small group of houses or a town. The Celts built many of them, and when Europe entered the Iron Age, around 600 BC. This is still long before the Roman conquest, which happened five or six centuries later. These hill forts proliferated. Some of them evolved into fortified settlements that were densely inhabited, and these are called opida. An opidum, opida in the plural, is a fortified town with ditches, elevations, and wooden walls. They were constantly inhabited, and they served as a fortress that protected hundreds, sometimes thousands of people and their belongings. When the Romans conquered Spain, Gaul, and later Great Britain, and parts of Germany, they encountered many of these hill forts and opida that required siege warfare techniques to be overcome. Some of them had foundations made of dry stone, that is to say, stone piled up without mortar, upon which wooden palisades were added. The Romans were very good at siege warfare. They adapted a lot of Greek siege engines to their needs and they pushed their technology further. They had uh, arrow machines, ballistas, catapults, and also scorpios, which were a crossbow-like type of device that fired arrows with a great accuracy. They attacked and broke walls with battering rams, and they had siege towers too. Most Celtic fortifications were unable to resist these aggressive weapons and siege techniques, and they didn't last long. But some opida that were manned with enough warriors could put up a fight. The largest siege of a Celt opidum 
was probably the battle of Alesia in Gaul. Tens of thousands of men had concentrated in it, together with civilian population. Julius Caesar, who commanded the Roman invasion army, besieged Alesia with an external wall that prevented them from exiting and protected the Romans against a counterattack from relief forces. People inside were starved to death until their chief, Vercingetorix, surrendered himself to save the others. After Alesia, which was a disaster for the coalition of Gallic tribes, there was no longer much resistance to the Roman conquest, and Gaul was turned into a Roman province. The same happened to a large part of the Celt world that was absorbed into the Roman Empire. With the Romans came new types of fortifications. The Romans built a lot of temporary fortifications for their armies when they were on the move. These included ditches and wooden walls. But once they had conquered a province, or to defend a strategic location, they built stone forts called castra, a castrum in the singular. Castra were fortresses designed to house and protect the soldiers, together with their equipment and supplies, when they were not fighting or marching. They could be temporary or permanent, on the frontiers, and as many things Roman, they were highly thought out and organized. They typically had a rectangular shape with rounded corners like a playing card, four gates, one on each side, two main axes that crossed at the center where the headquarters were located. In the first century AD, Starting at the time of Augustus, and after a period of very fast expansion, the empire needed to protect its frontiers, especially when they were far away from Rome, and more and more permanent castra were built of various sizes. Their remains can be found from the Hadrian Wall in Britain to the Middle East. Then, in the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire ended, leaving most of Europe to a period of decline called the Dark Ages, the first period of the Middle Ages. The population decreased, cities shrank, new kingdoms replaced the empire progressively. But the decline in agriculture and trade, the instability, and also the loss of many Roman technologies and uh, Roman administration. All of this meant that building in stone became rare. For centuries, it was limited to royal palaces or particularly important churches. New kingdoms filled the void left by the empire, but in practice they had very little control over their lands, because the frontiers were moving fast. They only had a very basic administration, and power remained very decentralized for a long time. This is the basis on which the feudal society of the Middle Ages emerged. It took shape over several centuries, and with it, castles began to rise. It is likely that castles evolved from the practice of fortifying a lordly house, as a, a central power was almost invisible. People organized themselves locally 
and local lords became the providers of security, justice and protection against invaders or bands of bandits. Until the 9th and 10th centuries, almost all lords halls or houses were made of wood, like almost every building. This made them fragile and of course at risk of a fire. To protest against this, they started to be surrounded by earthworks to keep enemies at a distance. Sometimes stone was incorporated into the building. And also an innovation, the raising of an artificial mound known as a motte. Small wooden castles were built on top of these motts, and in the 9th and 10th centuries, they became a common feature of European landscapes. These motts indicated the presence of a local lord, but don't imagine anything spectacular. Most of the time there was a single small wooden tower on top of it which was all that people had the means to build. But around this structure that brought security and authority, a hamlet, or at least a farm, could develop, with a bit more stability and the success of this new social organization, they grew in size in the 10th and 11th centuries and they turned into Mott and Bailey castles. Fortifications situated on top of a mot, surrounded by an enclosed courtyard or Bailey, and a protective ditch and palisade. This type of structure appeared in the west of France, in Normandy and Anjou, and from there it quickly spread to a all of Northern Europe. In the 11th century, it was introduced to Britain after the Norman invasion. And many castles that took bigger proportions along the centuries started like this. For example, Windsor Castle in England. It began as a modern Bailey castle built by William the Conqueror shortly after his invasion. This structure also spread to Germany, to the Netherlands, later to Denmark. From England, they moved to Scotland, Ireland. They were successful because they were easy to build by unskilled workers. Architecture in the 10th and 11th centuries had returned to a very basic set of practices. The times of Roman architects building large stone structures, like public buildings or aqueducts, these were really over. And there would be a medieval renewal of architecture, but it hadn't begun yet. So these uh, small modern Bailey castles were easy to build and efficient as defensive structures but they were also successful because they enhanced the lord's control over his lands. They provided a place to station a garrison, a very small army to control the area. They could become a center of administration to collect taxes. And in the case of more important lords, they could become a place to hold the court and have a small group of companions living with the Lord. This social and political importance explains why there was no direct correlation between the building of these first modern Bailey castles and the threat of invasion. In the 9th and 10th centuries, invasions were a serious threat for many parts of Europe. The Magyars from the east the Vikings from the north, the Muslims from the south. A lot of regions were contested and unsafe. 
and in these regions this may have stimulated the building of castles. But high concentrations of castles also appeared in relatively secure places too because these castles were also a mode of social, political organization. In the 11th century, there was a surge in their numbers. For example, in the south of France, in the region of Provence alone, there were 12 castles in 950. 50 years later, at the end of the millennium, there were 30 Another 30 years later, in 1030, there were a hundred. As these small basic castles were multiplying, some of them gained height and size. The tower or keep on top of the moat would soon be called a dungeon. They had windows, generally narrow windows for defense. But as projectiles could enter by the windows, these were moved up to a second or third story. And as the building needed to accommodate more and more people, it became wider and wider. In the 11th and 12th centuries, more and more keeps were built in stone in the more prosperous parts of Europe, which included the north of Italy, France, England, the Low Countries, and parts of Germany. Stone keeps brought considerable power and prestige to their owners. The feudal society was now well established, and it looked like a pyramid of allegiance. On top of the pyramid were kings and great lords, under them, they had smaller nobles who managed smaller areas, and so on, down to the base of the pyramid, that comprised all the peasants. Their status varied depending on the kingdoms and the regions. They could enjoy a few liberties, or completely belong to their masters in a legal state that was just a little bit better than slavery, the serfs. But not all the population fell into this pyramidal organization. There was also the clergy, and in cities, a small class of artisans and traders. But otherwise, out of free cities, most of the population depended on a lord, who had pledged allegiance to another lord, all the way up to the top where a king ruled. The hierarchy was fierce in medieval societies across most of Europe, and it was very difficult for individuals to escape the condition decided by their birth. But at the same time, this order was rather well accepted the concepts of individualism or democracy were absent. This order gave a place to everyone, and it worked in these difficult times. The nobles also had obligations to their peasants. They had to protect them, which was often necessary. They went to war when needed, and they were expected to be brave and sacrifice themselves in the defense of their serfs. This social order was also defended by the church, and following the church's guidance was not something to be questioned at the time. In practice, as the system was very decentralized and depended on the competence of the local lord, there were huge differences in the well-being of the population. It could either be the reign of the arbitrary, or occasionally the descent into chaos when a lord had gone away, or his lands were ravaged by war, or there could be periods of relative prosperity. But overall, 
for centuries, the social order lasted until more centralized states replaced feudal kingdoms after the Middle Ages. But it left traces until the 18th century in all of Europe. Only nobles could be military commanders. It was exceptional to see a commoner rise from the ranks. The particular set of rights and privileges attached to the aristocracy, like a different judiciary system or the exemption of taxes, this lasted even long after the nobles had left their keeps and stopped acting as the incarnation of political power on their lands. The aristocracy lost its privileges, but over several centuries and long after the end of the Middle Ages, sometimes progressively or more brutally in revolutions, as the times were changing and the concept of birthright became unacceptable. In Western countries nowadays, what we call privileges are advantages that individuals acquire at birth because of their set of circumstances. They are a phenomenon, but they are no longer a feature of the law as they were at the time. Birthright has become an oddity that only persists in monarchies for the sake of tradition and continuity of the state. But it is limited to a single family, and they are still supposed to respect the common law because otherwise it would be impossible to justify in modern democracies. We have to bear in mind that all these things, all these principles, all these democratic values that have been acquired along the centuries were entirely absent in the Middle Ages. What looks unfair and arbitrary nowadays was actually the norm back then. And without this social organization, castles as we know them could never have been built. They are an architectural projection of this ancient society. They appeared together with the installation of feudality. So I was telling you that keeps grew in size and symbolism along the 11th and 12th centuries. They could also become bigger and more powerful because of the relative prosperity of the period. For the first time in centuries, this period saw significant economic growth and a return to standards of living that resembled the late Roman Empire. There were less wars. Kingdoms had somewhat stabilized. In Spain, in France, in England, in Scotland, in Germany, there were now states, big and small, that controlled their frontiers better. International trade was revived and this brought prosperity to some regions and to some castle owners. The population grew again. So did the European cities, thanks to more excess resources from agriculture. This is also the time when Gothic cathedrals started to appear. Building in stone, in general, expanded. Some European rulers were even wealthy and powerful enough to project their power far away. The Crusades began. And with this arrival of more prosperous times, castles transformed too. Some lords now had the means, financial and human, to turn the center of their power into really impressive works. Bigger, higher, stronger, more comfortable, and able to display their influence and the order they embodied. 
It is during the 12th and 13th centuries that the model medieval castle that comes to mind when we think about castles appeared. And it started with dungeons, the keeps that initially were the sole buildings on top of a mound. In the 12th century, most dungeons adopted a square plan with thick walls, really thick, on the first floor. The walls were typically 10 to 13 feet thick. They were not entirely made of carved stone. The outer and inner layers were, and the space in between was filled with a mix of pebbles and mortar, or bricks. They became larger and higher, incorporating also decorative elements, like double windows that were a common feature of Romanesque architecture, like the ones seen in church bell towers. They were becoming stronger fortresses, but they were never purely functional. There were decorative requirements, and their size was also intended to turn them into a symbol of the Lord's power upon the landscape. The courtyard around the dungeon became larger too, and to protect it, the palisade was replaced with stone walls. At the entrance, the gateway gained defense features like arrow slits, narrow openings from which bowmen could shoot while being protected, and a portcullis, a metallic grid that could slide up or down to close the gate. Another innovation from this period to better defend the walls was the adjunction of more towers to them. Why more towers? Because they protruded from the walls, and they featured arrow slits on each level, so that archers could better target anyone nearing the walls, whatever the angle. By the end of the 12th century, and beginning of the 13th, new castles were designed with more and more attention paid to the defense of the curtain walls, the walls that defended the courtyard. New castles became polygonal in shape, with a tower at every corner, which provided enfilading fire for the walls. So in fact, a second defense perimeter was created. The dungeon was the most important structure, and it was a fortress in itself. But so became the curtain walls around it. In some designs, the dungeon even disappeared because it was less necessary, or it was turned into a lighter structure where the Lord and his family lived. And instead of being square and very thick with few windows, they became polygonal or cylindrical. The entrances of castles were also reinforced. And here a lot of inspiration was taken from Roman forts, these castra we talked about earlier. The typical entrance gate became surrounded with two towers, round or D-shaped, that could directly defend it. The old earthworks that surrounded the structure became a wide moat with or without water, that made the walls higher and harder to take with ladders. And as castles in the 13th and 14th centuries were now taking even bigger proportions, several concentric defenses were sometimes added. This is an innovation developed in the East in Crusader fortresses.
following the success of the First Crusade at the end of the 11th century. The Crusaders established small states in the Levant, on the coasts of Syria, Anatolia and Palestine, later monastic orders of knights, like the Knights Templar, also maintained a presence in the region. And to defend the land they had conquered, or to support these states, they built fortresses that replicated the models they knew from Europe, with an influence from Byzantine and Arab military architecture. For a time they were wealthy and powerful, especially the Knights Templar, and their fortresses in the Levant became some of the biggest in the world. An example of this is the Crac des Chevaliers, a crusader castle that is in Syria nowadays. It defended the frontiers of one of these crusader states, the county of Tripoli, that existed for a few decades. The Count of Tripoli, Raymond II, gave it to the Knights Hospitalier, who rebuilt it in the 12th century. And in the 13th century, they started a new construction phase that turned it into a concentric castle, meaning that there was a second wall protecting the first one, which made it even more intimidating for attackers. At its peak in the first half of the 13th century, the Crac des Chevaliers had a garrison of 2,000 men, and this allowed it to receive tribute from a large area around it. It was actually never captured in a conventional attack. By the middle of the 13th century, the fortunes of the Knights Hospitalier had reversed, and they were progressively thrown out of the region. In 1271, the crack was besieged by a Mamluk Sultan. The outer walls fell to the attackers after three weeks of fighting, so the knights retreated to the inner walls that were even more formidable. Ten days later, a letter was conveyed by the besiegers to the garrison, supposedly from the Grand Master of the Order, and this letter granted them permission to surrender so that lives would be spared. They surrendered, as no relief was expected, and the Sultan spared their lives, as promised. But it appeared that the letter was a forgery. So it seems that they surrendered on a misunderstanding, or by ruse. In any case, concentric castles were copied widely across Europe. There were many in Germany, in France or in Britain, and they made castles occupy a much larger area than before. In two or three centuries only, castles had turned from a single keep on a mound to several lines of defense, several gateways, higher and thicker walls. They had turned into formidable fortresses. But they were so expensive and slow to build that smaller local lords could not follow this. Typically, in the 13th century, it took 10 years to build a new castle. So, smaller castles that just looked like fortified houses stayed in use for many of them until the end of the Middle Ages. Another innovation brought back from the Crusades was machicolation from French machicoulis which is an opening, like a drop box, high on a defensive wall, from which stones or 
other materials such as boiling water or oil could be dropped on attackers. The origin of matriculation are in Syria. The Crusades brought this design to European castles so that by the 14th century all the main features of medieval castles were in place one or several curtain walls a keep at the center that could be defended on its own as a last resort towers all around that gave the capacity to defenders to use bows and later crossbows from every angle powerful doors with their own towers a drawbridge one portcullis or several to maintain the building defend it and project power and influence all around which was the point of creating such a big and expensive structure the castle had to house hundreds sometimes thousands of people it was a social administrative political center successful lords those who had several vassals would regularly hold courts which means they received temporarily some of their vassals and guests occasionally traveling entertainers the laws of hospitality meant that any traveling noble and his people could expect to be received in a castle and contrary to what one may think the nobility was very mobile in the middle ages the peasants were not they didn't have the possibility or the right to leave their place of birth but nobles moved almost all the time not just for enjoyment or to go to war they did it because the nature of the feudal system required them to constantly check and maintain the personal relationships of dependents they had with other lords above or under them this sociability was really important and the most mobile of all courts was the one of the king kings spent a large part of the year traveling around their kingdom on their own lands and on the lands of their vassals which was a way of constantly consolidating the kingdom maintaining its integrity since the kings had no direct administration of the lands of their vassals and many times in the middle ages powerful vassals allied between themselves against kings or took their autonomy this happened to the kingdom of france with the duchy of burgundy at the time of the hundred years war the dukes of burgundy were theoretically vassals of the king of france but they had uh, advanced their wealth and influence so much including uh, outside the kingdom because by the end of the middle ages they controlled regions like flanders and parts of the netherlands so that they in fact seceded from the kingdom of france and allied with the english kings it took decades including after the end of the hundred years war to reincorporate burgundy into the kingdom when kings were powerful and respected like uh, richard the first in england or philip the fourth or louis the ninth in france their vessels stayed in check but when they were weakened there was always a risk of uh, explosion or civil war in the kingdom so kings traveled and uh, receiving them was an honor but also a big burden because this court had to be fed housed and entertained for weeks 
before they moved on to their next destination. All of this happened inside castles, behind these thick walls. So the normal life of a castle was to alternate periods of intense activity, when hundreds of people had to be fed, the kitchens were busy, soldiers and servants were running around everywhere, when the Lord was present and guests were housed. And then the castle turned to a quiet place as soon as they had left. When the Lord was away, he typically left his wife in charge with the help of a chamberlain, an intendant, and only a few dozen people were necessary to uh, maintain and watch the castle. Domestic life was very important to castles, and it is one aspect of the Middle Ages where society was maybe not as patriarchal as one could uh, imagine. The wives were not peripheral in castles' administration. They were central. They had rights, and because castles were also social centers, their role was quite prominent. When their husband was away, they were most of the time responsible for it, and uh, they gave orders to everyone. In uh, the aristocracy, when women got married, they received a dower, a provision, typically one-third of their husband's estate, which was theirs for life. So they also were owners of the castle and the lands. In case they would be widowed, they kept it, and the two remaining thirds would go to their children with the Lord. So, more than half of the time, women were actually in charge of castles, either because their husband was away, which was frequent, or because they were widows. They were educated, they patronized the arts, so even though they had less rights and freedoms than men, at every level of society, not just in the nobility, the Middle Ages were rather better for women than uh, the centuries before. In Western antiquity, in Greece, in Rome, women had even less autonomy. To a small extent, medieval literature reveals a little evolution in their status. They are still passive in chivalry stories, and the stories focus on male heroes. But there were also stories of courtly love, like the legend of Tristan and Isolde, in which uh, two lovers are put a bit more on the same level, and the feelings of women matter. I recently told you stories about Greek mythology, and there was nothing of this in them. Female goddesses have their autonomy, in Greek mythology, but otherwise, human women are always objects. They don't choose anything, they don't think, they don't speak, they don't evolve at all, and they matter only as the motivation for warriors or heroes, who are the ones living the story. So, in this sense, the life that developed in castles and uh, in medieval society was the timid beginning of an evolution that acknowledged at least the intellect and the rights of women, even if it was to keep them confined to the domestic field. But domestic life was very important to castles, because despite their formidable defenses and their military vocation, most castles built in the Middle Ages actually never knew conflicts or sieges. There were some, and we're going to talk about it, but for centuries, 
they remain particularly safe places, either because they discouraged attacks, or, and that's the main reason, because all their defenses that were built and maintained at a high cost served more a political and symbolic role than a military one. They avoided conflicts first because the majority of them were not close to a frontier. They were spread all across medieval kingdoms, and only in case of a civil war, or to protect against revolting peasants, they could have served as fortifications. Second, because taking them was rarely worth the cost, and they could be avoided by an army. All weapons had a short range, so it was easier to leave a castle behind, even though it could have consequences later, because their garrison could interfere with communications. But in fact, the majority of medieval battles took place away from castles, in front of cities, or in an open field. Beginning a siege and waiting for the inhabitants of a castle to starve could take weeks or even months, years sometimes, and it required a lot of soldiers to effectively encircle a castle, so it happened, but rarely. A frontal assault on a castle, or an aggressive siege with siege weapons, is something that happened a few dozen times in the entire Middle Ages, and there were hundreds of castles. There were various options available to attack a castle until the 14th and 15th centuries, when gunpowder and gun artillery began to be used and this completely changed the game. But before that, the first option was to undermine walls with a sap. It took a lot of time, but it could be effective because the foundations of castles were generally not very deep underground. The attackers would dig a tunnel from a point that was out of reach from the castle's men and place wooden supports inside the tunnel to prevent it from collapsing. Once the tunnel had reached under the castle's walls, they would set the supports on fire. The tunnel would collapse and uh, bring down the structure above, which was very heavy. Medieval armies also knew all the siege weapons that the Romans used a millennium before, and more. Actually, medieval engineering and architecture made big progress, and this was one of the bases of a medieval renewal in the 12th century, when Gothic cathedrals and large castles appeared. These huge works required building techniques and calculations that were still very empirical, but made significant progress from the 10th century that allowed for productivity gains. For example, between the 10th and 12th centuries, it is estimated that the number of water mills about doubled in France and in England Records are lacking for other countries, and water mills started to be used for many industrial tasks like tanning, paper making, tool sharpening, or to provide a flow of air in metallurgy. Windmills are an invention from the 12th century. They appeared in a triangle between Flanders the north of France and the east of England, and from there they spread to the rest of Europe. Another medieval machine is uh, the treadwheel crane. The Romans used it 
but this technology was no longer used and it was reintroduced during the Middle Ages. It came very handy for the building of castles and cathedrals. It consists of a wooden wheel inside which a person can walk. The rotation of the wheel provides a force that uh, the multiplies the lifting capability of a person through a, a ropes system. Stone blocks that were several hundreds of pounds heavy could be lifted this way. This ingeniosity was also used in siege warfare. They could build balisters or springholds, which were relatively light machines. A springhold is like a baluster, but with inward swinging arms. These machines could throw stones and javelins. Both are like giant crossbows. They also built siege towers on wheels that could be pushed to contact with the walls. But the most destructive and feared weapon against castles was the trebuchet, an invention from the 12th century too. A trebuchet is a type of catapult that uses a long arm to throw a projectile, generally a heavy stone, it uses a counterweight to swing the arm. Thanks to their size and effectiveness, trebuchet could uh, throw really heavy blocks at several hundred yards, and when used repeatedly against uh, a wall during a siege, they could create a bridge. But what really compromised castles with their thick and high walls and their defense mechanisms was the advent of gunpowder and artillery in Europe. As you probably know, black powder is a Chinese invention and it took several centuries for it to reach Europe. The first artillery powered by gunpowder appeared in the 14th century. At first, guns were very inaccurate and unpredictable. They made more noise than actual damage. But better guns were developed. And in the 15th century, they became an alternative to trebuchets. Their advantage was a greater range and power. It was hard for existing castles to respond to the threat of guns. Some had uh, even thicker walls built, or an earthen bank piled up behind the curtain walls to absorb the shock of impact. Another option was to prefer round towers, because the curving sides were more likely to deflect a shot than a flat surface. But existing castles with square or rectangular towers could not change this easily. As artillery continued to make progress in the 16th century, medieval castles became obsolete as fortresses in just a few decades. Only their social and political functions, which were considerable, remained, but castles had lost their aura of invincibility, so a lord deciding to make a castle his residence was no longer projecting an image of power, and the symbolic and political role of castles began to crumble. The aristocracy began to transform castles into country houses, or most of the time build new residences that dropped the military aspect for aesthetics and comfort. An example of this transition is the numerous chateaux of the Loire Valley in France, built during the Renaissance for many of them. <laughs> 
they retain a few decorative features that remind of the Middle Ages, like towers and roofs. But more than anything, they reflect the ideals of the time. More ornaments, more light with large windows, parks, a gracious architecture. They no longer look like fortresses at all. Since then, aristocratic and royal residences have no longer been fortresses anymore. And the medieval style of building fell completely out of fashion for centuries. Until the 19th century, when there was a revival of the medieval and gothic styles. With the romantic interest in the Middle Ages and chivalry, mock castles inspired by gothic and medieval times were built again. An example of this is the castle of Neuschwanstein in Germany. It is magnificent, but still quite far from a medieval castle, because being faithful to medieval designs would have left it cold and very dark by the standards of the time, and nobody wanted to live like that anymore. So it looks more like a fairy tale castle than a real medieval fortress, in fact. However, the need for fortresses had not disappeared, and an innovation that replaced castles in this role appeared in Italy around 1500. The angled bastion. A bastion is a structure projecting outward from the curtain wall of a fortification. It can fire from the sides and with several bastions well positioned to cover all angles, a star fort can be built. These forts became the new fortresses in the age of gunpowder until the 19th century. They are very low and thick for protection against artillery. And they could house garrisons, but they are no place for domestic life. So this type of fortifications actually returned to the old functions of fortresses from Roman times and before, when they were only military structures and nothing else. Star forts were very hard and deadly to capture, which favored the defensive, and this deeply changed European warfare for the following centuries. They had a long range with their artillery, and the size of armies had increased, meaning that many more soldiers could be stationed in these forts. So they couldn't be ignored like medieval castles anymore. It would have been too dangerous to leave one uh, unoccupied behind. Warfare became much slower than before. It turned into a series of sieges and there were relatively less open battles. The wars of the 17th and 18th centuries fought on European soil when, where there were star forts, tended to be very uh, static. Many star forts can be visited nowadays. The countries with the most star forts are the Netherlands and France, because they both fought heavily on their frontiers from the 16th to the 18th centuries. This was broken only in the 19th century, with uh, the development of even more powerful artillery and explosive shells that rendered surface fortifications too fragile. They were replaced with uh, simpler polygonal forts that extended underground. In the 20th century, to this day, 
fixed fortifications have lost more and more importance. They are too easy to target from afar or bomb from above. So in military terms, the function that castles occupied has actually disappeared almost nowadays. So we have reached the end of our little journey for tonight. You can now drift to a restful sleep. And if you don't feel sleepy, it's okay. There are many more stories awaiting you. Just pick one. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.